So, yeah, I'm John Bunn with an underscore, which is almost as cool. I got like a tail at the end of my name. <laughs> I missed your joke entirely. It just completely cut out. Darn it. <laughs> it was funny. Just like laugh and like pretend. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the How to Film Weddings podcast. Today it's just me, John Bunn, your host. Nick was busy, um, but today I had an incredible interview um, with a guy named Eric Floberg. I met him out at Venture Workshop about a month ago. Um, he has a crazy awesome YouTube channel, some very incredible wedding films. He's a filmmaker and photographer based in Chicago. Um, we just had a really good question, a really good interview just about like um, being you, being uniquely you. Um, we talked just a lot about leaning into what makes you different. Um, and it was just a, a really good conversation, just kind of talking about the process that you go through from starting to getting to where people really um, look at you as an industry leader. We talk about all kinds of things. So let's just jump right into the episode today with Eric Floberg. All right. So thank you so much, Eric, for being on the show. Um, why don't you do us a favor real quick? Uh, inter introduce yourself to the How to Film Weddings community. Who are you? Where are you at when you're recording? What is it you spend your time doing? Yeah. Uh, my name is Eric Floberg. I am from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, ever heard of it? <laughs> Lol. Uh, <laughs> great start. Um, <laughs> so I live on the north side of Chicago and uh, I've been doing weddings for She's eight years now. I uh, shot my first one in 2011. The first one I ever shot was video. I do photo and video uh, for weddings and do uh, the portraits and some commercial work here and there. Uh, but yeah, most of uh, the majority of work that I do is, is shooting weddings and I feel like I'm pretty seasoned in that now. Uh, I have a wife and two kids and one more on the way. That's a surprise that nobody knows yet. So, uh -oh. but oh, well, I'm basically been leaking anybody. it out everywhere. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, I uh, I love living in Chicago. Love doing what I do. Uh, it's insane the opportunities I get doing this stuff. So I also do YouTube and love being able to share some of my knowledge. Uh, I used to be a teacher, and so it's really cool to be able to educate people in the space that I love to work in. So. So he says he does YouTube. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't just do YouTube. Like he, he kills YouTube. So if you haven't checked out his channel, Stop. you'll have to do that. We'll let you plug that here in a bit. Um, I met you, what, a month ago? Yeah. The last month at the Venture Workshop. Yep. Shout out to Venture. Yeah. Um, there was just like a line of people wanting to meet Eric nope. and talk with Eric and like nope. get his autograph and like... Um, you were the MC of the event. How'd you get involved with Venture? Um, so I got to know Kaylin and Christine of White and Reverie a while back through some mutual friends. And so once we started following each other a bit on social media, uh, they kind of saw what I was doing on YouTube, saw my personality. And last fall when they brought Levi on board with their company, uh, just gave me a phone call and, uh, they were like, hey, that might be kind of interesting if you, I mean, do you want to be the MC of our workshop? And I was like, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> They're like, it's paid. I was like, all right. Uh, so I went to <laughs> the second one they ever did. I think it was the second uh, in New Mexico. So much fun, uh, kind of like a camp vibe. And I guess they liked me as an MC enough to invite me back <laughs> for the Denver version, which like you said, was just last month. Um, Love those guys. I love that community. It's so much fun to be a part of it. It's really interesting to kind of be in that position of the MC because it's like you're not a teacher, you're not someone who's attending. So you're just kind of like that. That's kind of, I mean, I was kind of in that boat a little bit too, being like a podcast right. host that was there that they brought right. out was like, well, what do, what do I do during the class time? Yeah. Like, okay, I'll like. But it was, it was such a cool experience. Um, rewinding back to like when you got started eight years ago, um, something like that, like what, what got you into weddings and what, what kind of were the first weddings, uh, what were those like for you? Like, did you know what you were doing? Did you have any experience beforehand? What was that like at the beginning? I did have experience, but everything was terrible. And, uh, so, I mean, the first videos I ever shot were in middle school. Well, I even shot at my parents' camcorder before that. So 
like my whole childhood uh, and into teen years, I was shooting videos for fun. Never knew anything technical, was always shooting on point and shoots, just editing in iMovie or Windows Movie Maker. And, oh, shout out to oh, Windows Movie those Maker. Those are the days. <laughs> uh, the days. Yeah, so seventh grade Spanish <laughs> class is when I made my first video. And like, f it's it's sounds stupid, but it, li it like totally changed my life uh, doing that project because it just mm -hmm. sent me into a trajectory of making videos every year and every class I could trying to make the best uh, projects in the class through like teachers would even be like, here's your project. And I'd be like, can I do a video? And they're like, I guess. And I'm like, sweet. <laughs> uh, and, uh, so yeah, I just, I constantly was making stuff all the way through college. And since I, since I got in a DSLR, I got a Canon T2i, uh, for Christmas in 2011, 2010. And just started making videos with that thing. And once people started recognizing a little bit of a quality spike, they're like, Hey, you know, I had a friend from high school and her sister was getting married. She's like, Hey, my sister can married. Do you, you want to film a wedding? I was like, I guess. And she's like, what do you charge? I go $300 is what I charge. <laughs> uh, and of course. shot that like edited an hour and a half long edit that included the whole ceremony and all of the speeches and literally everything. Cause I had no idea. In what year, what year that was, was 2011? 11. Okay. On the T2I? On the T2I and my buddy's uh Canon 60D. I don't even know. Okay. Was that even around then? Something like that. One of the Maybe. double digit Ds. Yeah. I think it, I think it, I think yep. it was like the upgrade. Yeah. It was the, the 60D. T2i. Yeah. So yeah. But he had more experience than I did. He's actually a steady cam op in LA now for like big sets, which is kind of crazy. But uh, our humble beginnings, I literally, I actually had to leave the reception early and he just covered the rest of it, which is hilarious. <laughs> uh, but I edited yeah. that film together and I brought it to, it was, like I said, it was family friends. So I brought it to their house. We all watched it all together, like their whole family. We sat down and watched it. An hour and yeah. a half. And they loved it. And I was like, cool. It was like up yeah. on like a 70 inch plasma TV. I was like, whoa, I thought it was so cool. Yeah. It was such a good feeling. It was just so exciting to do that and share that with them. And uh, just kept booking weddings, wedding after wedding after that, and, you know, sharing it on YouTube. And then people just kept asking me. So I just kept doing them. And then, I, was, you know, I studied to be a teacher in, in college and kept shooting weddings in the midst of that. Once I became a teacher, only taught for three years before it became unbearable to balance both. Because <laughs> my third year of teaching in 2016, I was shot 25 weddings that year and taught full time. So it was not good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was eight years, whatever ago. Fast forward to 2019. Um, what does you know? You said you've added. You do photography. What does like a typical wedding look like for you today? The price, the packages, that kind of stuff. Sure. Yeah. All so photo and video. All my stuff is customizable. I always pitch it that way. Uh, always do hourly coverage. Um, excuse me. I don't. I don't package in any prints or uh, photo album or extra edits. So, with photo. It's always coverage six, eight, ten hours, and they can add additional hours if they'd like. They get printing rights to all their edited images on a gallery, and then they can order anything they want after that. They can order prints from their gallery. Uh, they can order photo albums through me, uh, whatever they choose. So that's the way I pitch it. I was like, I, I don't want to wrangle you into buying anything you don't want to buy. You know, some packages for photographers include all the printing rights, but it also includes an album. If you don't want an album or an engagement session, like you don't have to be wrangled into doing that. And uh, that also just gives, um, that also just gives a bit of perspective on my worth, at least what I think as a shooter with the hourly coverage uh, and letting them realize that it's, it's worth that price. So, that's the photo side. The video side, I literally have just two packages. Both of them include a four to six minute montage um, with music, speeches, audio from the day. And the second one just includes raw footage for an extra 500 bucks. So for photo, I go right now anywhere from six grand to eight grand, uh, 8,500. And videos at like 7,500 to 8,000. And then additionally, we'll do a full ceremony edit if they want it or a full speech edit if they want it at 1500 and 750 respectively. Um, yeah. yeah. So I'm just kind of, a, so that kind of gives a, gives everybody kind of a, a general basis of like what you're, what you're charging, yeah. what you're doing. And I'm just kind of at the price point now where, uh, like this year I'm shooting 27 weddings. 
uh, all booked on anywhere from 4500 to 7500 and I've upped those prices pretty significantly for this next year because really the goal is to be shooting half the amount. I want to be like right in the 12 to 15 range next year so that I could start pursuing mm -hmm. YouTube a bit more. I could start pursuing education a bit more uh, and some other creative ventures that I have. So, so YouTube, um, you know, I'm at Venture and I, the first I'd ever heard of you, no offense, sorry, <laughs> was, uh, was the intro to Venture the morning yeah. of whatever, when you showed us a video of you trying to do a flip at a wedding <laughs> and face planning, not once, twice. but twice. <laughs> and it was hilarious. And I like, um, like, I don't know, like there was something just the way about the way you communicated that at the beginning, I was just kind of like, who's, who's this guy? Like he's a little, little quirky maybe, or like, why is he here? What, like, why am I going to, but like the authenticity and I hate even using that word, like you were just okay with being you. And I was even having this talk with my daughter last night as we're watching America's Got Talent, mm -hmm. you know, it's like that person is attractive because they're not trying to be somebody that they're yeah. not. They're trying to, you know, that person is attractive to, and entertaining and, and enjoyable and you want to be around them because of their quirks, yeah. not because they just look like everyone or act like everyone. Um, so I want to like, that was my first interaction with you is just like, who's this guy? And then by like two minutes in, I was just like, I love this uh -huh. guy. Like, I, I, I love this guy. He's a, a cool dude. And like, he is somebody that like, I want to like, I'm immediately like searching you on Instagram and searching you on YouTube and like, oh my gosh, he's got all this good stuff. And uh, since then, in the last month, I've kind of like gone through your YouTube page or whatever. So I want to talk about two things, just number one, being authentic to you. Yeah. And then number two, just like YouTube and like what you're, what, what are you excited about with YouTube? What's your, what do you do over there on, on the YouTubes? Is it YouTubes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I call do you do on the I YouTubes? Call it the tube. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What do you do? So <laughs> talk about the tube and then how being authentic uh, has really given you, you know, more more of a, a, I don't even know what the word I'm looking for is, but being authentic has made you relatable on, on the team. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I have, I have like a, a tag phrase or catchphrase on YouTube that is uh, lean into what makes you different. And, uh, there's a lot of purpose behind that phrase because I started to realize that people started to pay attention to me and my work when I was really caring about leaning into the things I thought that made me unique. Uh, and that I did differently from the rest of the crowd. And so I, I, I joined this group on Facebook called Looks Like Film uh, for Photographers. And I, it was always like my goal to post a photo in there. And if you post a photo in there, it gets a certain amount of likes. They'll give you what's called a choo-choo. It's like the choo-choo train. You get featured on their website or it's stupid. But it's not stupid. I love those guys. Uh, but... Um, <laughs> I would like, uh, that's always, you know, that was always the goal. It's like, could I get a choo-choo? Could it, you know? And every time I got one of those, it was because I was shooting things very differently. Like I would post a photo I was really proud of it and like it would get no traction. And then I would post a photo with a tilt shift lens or I would post a multiple exposure in there. And people like went bonkers over those photos because they just look so different than most of the things they were viewing in there. Um, and that frustrated me at first. I was just like, why does nobody care about my real work is what I consider like the normal stuff. And they only like these like little tricks that I do. And then I started to realize that that was something that really like profoundly sent me apart from the crowd and something that I actually really enjoyed doing and using like creatively. It, it was really fulfilling and exciting for me to shoot that way. And so when I came to the realization that I wanted to lean into those things more, that's when I started becoming more and more creative and I started mixing and matching different variables with those components, like with those things that I did creatively. And it just opened up this whole new world of creativity for me that I could apply to video as well. Uh, and so I felt like once I started doing that, people started paying attention to some of the stuff I was doing, uh, which was really cool and exciting. Uh, but at the end of the day, like, I don't know, it just, that, none of that stuff matters with the followers and all that garbage. It's, and kind of talking into that authenticity, I like, I don't know if you're familiar with the Enneagram and I don't know if anybody here is or whatever, you know, personality test. Oh yeah. Nick, Nick okay. loves himself. The Enneagram. I'm a three W two. I don't know what that means, but that's, that's me. Pretty sure that's what I am too. I'm a three. I know for sure. I don't know what wing I am. I don't know enough about it. Also yeah. said, I didn't get to meet Nick yeah. today. The bummer, but it'll happen eventually. Uh, 
It will happen. So that's like, I just, I'm geared towards like success and driven by success and wanting to be successful. So numbers are always an accurate way for me to measure that kind of success, uh, which can be healthy sometimes and very, very unhealthy most of the time. Uh, and so yeah. it's just a constant battle of me trying to figure out how that's not important at all, especially from a business perspective, like numbers just don't pay you anything. And uh, numbers don't fulfill you. They just don't. The more and more followers I get, uh, I, I find myself like doubting myself more and more and having imposter syndrome and feeling like I'm not fulfilled in my creative endeavors. And so no one can, no one should ever believe the lie uh, that the more followers you get, like the more fulfilled you're going to feel in doing what you're doing. It's just not going to yeah. happen. And so having that realization and always reminding myself of that just kind of lead, led me down the path of like, real true authenticity and i know that word is used so much but that's a that's a a common thing that i'm battling with as well it's like how do how do i how am i uniquely myself and a lot of time that mm -hmm. just resorts to and i've seen this a lot that people find it so relatable when you you're able to goof on yourself when you're able to prove <laughs> to them that you're making fun of yourself and that you're not afraid to show your faults uh, people really, mm -hmm. really relate to that because it's just the human experience. Uh, it frustrates me mm -hmm. more than anything to see people pretend uh, that they know everything. And even if they're, yeah. even if they clearly don't know something and they still <laughs> pretend to, like that just bothers me so yeah. much. I just, yep. I think it's, there's so much value in the vulnerability and the humility of just being like, yeah, I don't know. And it's fine. It's okay. You know? Uh, yeah. So... I really try to emphasize that with doing things that people would normally feel embarrassed doing, which at this point I'm just fine with doing. I don't care. Yeah. It, it is so attractive. Like I was watching the, how to make a YouTube video that mm -hmm. you made on your YouTube channel. And like, I legit just clicked it thinking <laughs> you're going to be teaching me how to make a YouTube yeah. video. But like, you know, the scene starts with you like waking, you know, the alarm clock going off and like you get out of your, you know, it's a shot of you getting out of bed. And then you basically narrate saying, this is the shot where I try to make you believe that I've been asleep and the camera has been rolling all night. And this is and you just kind of are like making fun of. But at the same time, the quality of the video is legit. And like it's, it's just so uniquely you that it's very attractive. And like that's kind of one of the main points, you know, when we're talking about leaning into what makes you different, like you know, you can harness that in a certain way, which is good. But like, I think so many of us are just trying to look like Eric Floberg or White and Reverie or David with Forestry, or we're trying yeah. to look like that instead of just being like uniquely you, you know? And so, um, that in itself, you know, like our listeners, you know, that don't try to be like, and, and there's a process that, that goes along mm -hmm. with this. There's, you start out and you you do have to look to others for inspiration and you do want to shoot like them. Totally. And you do, but like as you get going and as you start realizing the things you love and be more confident in yourself, that's when you can really like realize that's when I started to realize like, oh, people will love the fact that I am you know, a, a fan of Taylor Swift and of The yes. Office. And I, I'm a, you know, I'm a hopeless romantic that cries at, you know, TV commercials and I cry pretty much every day and I have two little girls and, or whatever the things are that make, you know, it's like you're immediately relating to me right now in this conversation. Cause it's like, oh, that guy is a normal dude. But if I, you know, and I think we get a lot of success on the How to Film Weddings podcast, shameless plug, <laughs> because we are just we're we, we're not we don't know it all and we're not trying to prove you know you said don't pretend to know everything and it's like we don't we don't know everything and so like that in itself is is so relatable to the crowd right. and that's what stood out to me about you when we we're at venture i appreciate that man because i yeah i i honestly that's one of my biggest goals is i don't ever want anybody to come at like you know whatever kind of following i have and make them feel like any sort of intimidation because that's all garbage and nonsense. I want to be, I want to be approachable just like anybody else. I don't want to feel like anybody feels like I'm on a pedestal or anything, uh, just because of some stupid number. Uh, it makes no sense. It, it doesn't help anybody. Um, if, you know, if I really felt that way, like the kind of inflation of ego would be insane and yeah, all that nonsense is just stupid. And yeah, I love being able to meet people who have seen, my stuff and 
just talk about videos that have inspired them. That's one of the most fulfilling things for me, being an educator and uh, going through college and doing that and getting back into that space of educating people on what I'm most passionate about and seeing them take the leap to like jump full time after a video I've made is so, in, it's just so insane. Uh, I get DMs all the time. It's just like, man, yeah. I'm going to do it. I'm, you like convinced me I was on the fence and I'm just going all in. I'm like, what? It's so, so awesome. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So like on the YouTube channel itself, you do have, you do have a big following of people, 30,000, 35,000 people subscribe to you. And like, you know, I think that people see that and they're like, oh, I want to attain that and then I'll be fulfilled or I'll be happy. Um, as opposed to like more fo followers, like you said, doesn't mean more fulfillment. Um, and so with that, like, I mean, as we're getting more and more followers of our podcast, the things that make me the happiest are the things that like, I'm the truest to myself about. And like, you're a teacher, you know, by nature, by heart. Um, tell me about your YouTube channel and your goals with it. Um, not just like a big following, but like, what are you, what are you trying to do with your YouTube channel? Yeah. So I started a YouTube channel like 10 years ago, just posting stupid nonsense on it. And when I was a teacher, all, a lot of students, a lot of my students, a lot of kids throughout the school found my YouTube channel and <laughs> they just, uh, they like did a deep dive on everything and they would bring up specific videos to me like at lunch. I'm like, what? How? And what's hilarious is they were like my first couple hundred subscribers were like all like tweenagers which is hilarious um <laughs> that's this a, a price you pay to look like you look you know just <laughs> yeah been Pop there star. yeah <laughs> uh yeah and what's crazy is one of them actually came to my workshop he's 18 now and came to my workshop in february uh, which is insane uh really cool but yeah. Yeah. So that's where it started. And literally all of them back in, you know, 2013 through 2015 were like, you should keep making more YouTube videos. Like you, you're really good at making YouTube videos. And you know, you hear a bunch of 12 year olds saying that you're like, okay, cool. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and I never wanted to, it was, it was before like everybody was really going after it hard, like before McKinnon and you know, all those people. And so yep. I didn't see any value in it at all. Obviously now I'm like, man, yep, wish I would have done more back then, but uh, <laughs> it is what it is. And I continued that sentiment all the way up until two years ago. And my friends, Daniel and Rachel, who have uh, a YouTube channel called Mango Street, they're out in LA, like super successful uh, with their channel. They were back in Chicago. We were hanging out once and Rachel's just like, yeah, you should, uh, you should start a YouTube channel. I'm like, I don't have the time to do that. And she just kept going, nah, you should just do it. Just do it. I'm like, ah, fine. <laughs> uh, so I did and started making videos on like my bread and butter creative stuff. Uh, did one on the Brenizer method, which is uh, panoramic stitching and post of photos about my tilt shift, about double exposures. And those videos uh, did really well, st like statistically, and started to you know grow more of a following. Last year, didn't really go after it very hard because I was like, "What's the end game? I don't know. Just I don't know. Make a few videos mm -hmm. here and there, have some fun." Which I did. It was a blast, and I loved making them. But this off season is when I really decided, you know, uh, that's there's something here. There's a lot of opportunity in doing this. I really want to actually go after it. And so I made the decision to be really intentional about it this off season. Uh, and so that kind of resulted in some of those uh, videos that were pretty successful at the beginning of this year and um, just, you know, growing the subscriber base. And um, yeah, again, it's like, where is this going? What is it leading to? I still don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. I do know in some sense uh, I want to be online teaching. I want to, be able to offer a course online that people can purchase. Uh, I love seeing people. I love seeing people grow in their businesses and find the inspiration to do so. And I feel like I have enough ex experience and uh, knowledge in the space to to give that. Uh, at the same time, them uh, giving me the opportunity to grow my business uh, with that endeavor, just a really cool uh, uh, you know relationship to to be able to do that. So. That's not anything I'm doing in the coming months, but hopefully by the end of the year, that's something I want to have ready to go. 
I have some affiliate stuff with different brands and I've been doing some sponsorships on the channel, which just isn't that much money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> kind of whatever ad revenue is there. It's still not much money at mm -hmm. all. So it, a lot of times doing YouTube is just like exhausting and, um, mm -hmm. so frustrating by, you know, different measurements of what you can deem successful on YouTube based on views and the mm -hmm. money you make on ad revenue and subscribers gained and all that nonsense. But I'm getting opportunities left and right to do really, really cool things that never would have happened before. The, I was on uh, another podcast today and it looks like I'll probably be doing a commercial for them and their brand. They found me through YouTube. His wife is on the board of Professional Photographers of America, PPA. They asked me to be a speaker in uh, at their conference in January. Uh, That's um, huge. Being an MC at Venture Workshop. Like there's all these different things that uh, it's just this avenue that people see a different side of me, see the, um, you know, see the ability of, of me being able to teach, uh, and to, I don't know, just be myself like you were talking about before. Yeah. And yeah, it just opens up this whole new world, which is what I love the most. It's exciting. It's just like, I don't know what's going to come next. And yeah. it's cool to see what could happen and what will happen. And it's, I feel like it's just starting. So it's. Yeah. And I, I think a, a lot of what we talk about is the process here. You know, we talk about like a microwave versus the crock pot. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we want to build our businesses with this crock pot, this slow. But like, it's funny how you can do 10 years of work and then become an overnight success mm -hmm. or you can like something can just pop or somebody can see one of your videos or um, and that's kind of where I wanted to move the conversation. Um, I wanted to talk. I, I found your um, the Yosemite video that you did on your mm -hmm. page. And, and I listened and watched that video the other day, just kind of, um, you were talking about how you got the video, um, and you know, just broke down like everything you did for this Yosemite video. But like right before this, you were just saying like the, the opportunities that certain things open up for you, you don't realize while, you know, never would have you imagined that starting a YouTube channel, you're going to be filming this big commercial or, you know, getting these workshops or doing these different things. And there's this excitement to it. But I think a lot of people are so microwave minded or short term thinking minded that it's like, you know, I see nothing but major success for, you know, you might feel like you're not making a ton on whatever with YouTube right now, but it's like, if you just keep being the Eric Floberg that I see online, it's like, you're, you know, it's just going to only continue to grow for you. So with our listeners, like um, you, you booked a wedding in Yosemite. I, I'd love for you just to kind of talk to me about booking that and how you booked it. Cause I have a couple of questions um, just about that, that I think that the listeners will really appreciate. So tell us about um, the recent Yosemite wedding you did, um, how you got connected with it. Just give me, if you can, to some of that story of like what you did to get that, all the deets. Yeah. So uh, it's a, it's a long story and it's a good one, but I'll give the, as, as condensed of a version as I can. They can watch the video yeah. if they want to, you know, we'll, we'll link sure. your channel, but give yeah, give us the condensed version. Yeah, I have version. like a full 30 minute video on it, but the condensed version is that I got connected to the Chicago community of photographers and filmmakers as soon as I moved here from central Illinois when I was in college and that was in 2013 that we moved up here, got involved in some Facebook groups, but also made connections to some photographers down in central Illinois who moved to Chicago as well. They started getting into the Chicago market. We're starting shooting uh, weddings consistently. And one friend, Jasmine, she asked me to second shoot for her one time. Uh, I guess I did a good enough job for her that she uh, wanted me to come back and sh shoot for her again. She referred me to another Chicago couple um, uh, photographers who had me second shoot for them as well when uh, the wife got pregnant. And I shot with them multiple times and they started handing me referrals of my own, which I, then I started booking in Chicago. So that's sort of like the base of that, where that started. So community is a huge part of that and getting referrals in Chicago. So I was actually shooting video alongside Jasmine at a wedding in 2016. Uh, and she referred me to this couple. She had already booked them for photo. And she's like, you should check out Eric. He does video. They booked me. And when we were in, uh, when we were doing getting ready with the ladies, Jasmine was talking to a bridesmaid who happened to be Ellie, uh, the Yosemite bride. Uh, and 
she, she I had overheard like, oh yeah, I'm getting married in Yosemite. And I was like, what? Uh, and she's like, yeah. And Jasmine was joking around like, oh, do you have a photographer yet? And she's like, oh yeah, we booked Narav Patel. And Narav Patel is like freaking genius. Like one of my biggest inspirations is a, a wedding photographer and a portrait photographer. I was like, you booked Narav Patel. And she's like, you know Narav Patel. I was like, yeah, I know Narav. Are you kidding me? <laughs> uh, she's like, yeah, yeah, we booked him. And I was like, do you need a videographer? And uh, <laughs> she's like, no, we haven't booked that yeah. yet. So I busted out my card. I was like, just let's talk. Just let me, just shoot me an email. Let's chat about it. She didn't email me, shot the wedding. Months went by, didn't hear anything. And so I was tempted to just like reach out to my couple and be like, hey, yeah, so that bridesmaid of yours like good and I didn't do that but my last hope was when I delivered that client's film that Ellie would see it and that she would like be incentivized to reach out to me and sure enough the day after I dropped it she emailed me and was just like oh we love their film like we'd love to chat so at that point I was like okay I have a little bit of negotiation power but at the same time I'm gonna book this wedding for whatever it takes like if I have to pay them, I will, you know, like it was one of those situations where <laughs> yeah. and I think that's perfectly okay to do. And plenty of people will push back against that. Like don't shoot for free. Uh, you're like crippling the industry. Yada, yada, yada. Um, I think there's high value in taking cuts to be able to do stuff like this because what that wedding meant for me was I did give them a, a cut for sure. I still booked it in all in $3,500 which is what my base package was. And I didn't include any travel, so I just ate all the travel costs. I probably profited like, I don't know, two grand on that wedding, something like that, which was not much for me at that point. I was, you know, I was making local weddings for 45. So, but to have that for my portfolio was better than anything. And I knew that going into it Mm because I knew the story. I had already chatted with them. They were exactly the kind of clientele I wanted to be working with. Uh, they were doing a small ceremony in Chicago first and flying out to Yosemite to just have this adventure. And so that got all these creative ideas flowing in my head. And yeah, so I knew I was going to do it different. And I knew it was going to be my marketing and it ended up being one of the best decisions I made with my wedding career. Uh, undoubtedly, I shot that wedding and when I made it, uh, pretty much half of the wedding films I book now are because of that film. Like I literally have, exactly. I literally have clients come to me. They're like, we saw that one and that's all we needed to see. And that's it. And we're booking you. And they don't even ask the price. Yeah, it, dude, that, that, that kind of stuff is the, the kind of stuff that makes like the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Cause it's like, yes, that is, you know, that process, you know, that a lot of us, especially the newer, you know, people, even, even if you've been doing it for a while, like just it, I think in these groups, you know, we, we talk about it a lot, but just like people are shaming others for like building their portfolio or whatever. But I would encourage the listeners to like be, you know, you weren't just thinking about like the food that you needed to eat that day. You were thinking this could open up doors for me. And sometimes you do things and you swing and it doesn't open up a door for Mm -hmm. you. But like, if you're not pushing and trying those things, if you're not doing, you know, your YouTube channel, what doors wouldn't have been open that you just don't know. Or, and then, so you, you did this $3,500 wedding and you said, um, like that it has now gotten you like, when was this wedding? That was July of 2017. So almost two years ago. So two, two years ago. Um, since then, what has changed since you, like, since you hit upload on that video, what, what kinds of things benefits, like, was it worth the $3,500 to do? 1000%. Yes. Um, I've since, uh, over doubled my prices and people are booking at that rate because of the legitimacy they see in a film like that. Uh, I filmed her sister's wedding in that December. Uh, they didn't have the budget to do it. But her parents, literally, her dad sent me a letter in the mail uh, with appreciation for Tyler and Ellie's film and said, we're actually going to gift this uh, to Lauren and Nick. So we we couldn't imagine anybody else filming their their wedding, her sisters. So I filmed that one. And then I filmed another one of their friends. And then I just got back from Hawaii filming another one of their friends at full price. And like they were there. We got to hang out with them. And it was just amazing and this one from Hawaii is like just about as epic as the Yosemite one and uh, you know I'm at a place now where it's like I 
won't compensate on price anymore the way I did that time. Because you don't have right, to. I don't have to yeah. anymore. And to be honest, I don't necessarily want to travel that much anymore. I'd like to stay more local just because travel's killing me. Mm -hmm. Like every time I freaking travel, someone breaks into my car and steals stuff. It's like freaking awful. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened at the end Chicago. of Chicago. Oh, it happened in Hawaii <laughs> on Saturday. Oh, but no. like, yeah, no. I don't know. Like every time I travel, something crazy happens like every single time. So that's like another thing. I'm like, it's not all glitz and glam. I swear. Like it looks yeah. awesome. It's hard. Like it's really hard. And it's, you make way more money shooting local weddings than you do travel weddings, but the travel weddings are marketing. Yeah. Like it's, that can really inspire mm -hmm. someone. I can tell you how many times I booked a local Chicago wedding because they saw the Yosemite film. You know, they saw a context where a story was so cool and exciting and they saw mm -hmm. themselves in it, even if it wasn't in Chicago. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I've never done any formal marketing, never done any like Google ads or, you know, like I care about SEO really or Instagram, Facebook, none of that. Mm -hmm. It's just all been organic kind of like uh, the slow cooker, like you were talking about, but you had mentioned something earlier where it's like people want the microwave kind of situation. And when they see something that looks like a microwave, maybe something like me in the past year with growing my YouTube channel, it's like most people don't recognize that it's taken me eight years of shooting to get to a place to have this kind of, you know, information and knowledge mm -hmm. to share. So, yeah. Well, I would say too, like watching the Yosemite film, like, there's a lot of factors that go into, like, if you sucked at what you did, like, if it wasn't good, even if you did take the opportunity, if it wasn't great, it wouldn't have popped. It wouldn't have been something that got you. So, like, what factors do you think that, uh, you know, what, what factors about that video um, that you did, like, would you say are what is making it pop now? Like, what kinds of things did you do in that video that are making people, like, what factors did it take to make a video like that, that people, does that make sense? I know that's a weird question, but like, what did it take to make something like that? what you, what was your, your creative process? What, what kind of stood out to you on like making something like that to pop? Yeah, it was, it, it, that? I told, yeah, I totally get what you're saying. It was, okay. well, first of all, like most people don't do that, right? M many people will do like an elopement in a cool place, but rarely will people like bring their whole wedding to that destination and they had like 150 people at that wedding so like that was an event that they wanted to celebrate with everybody and everyone was on board with doing that with them uh, because they're just they're also not one of those couples that's like yeah we just want to go to a really cool place we never go to cool places but they actually hike all the time and Yosemite is one of their favorite places on earth so this was like actually really monumental for them in their relationship it wasn't just a super hip rad place and more than that like they really care about their faith so back in Chicago they really wanted a small ceremony with their family at their local church which they did and that gave me the creative uh, ability to make something way different than anything else out there because the way I opened up the film was like I made it very clear, like this takes place in Yosemite. I open up with all the sound design, all the images, like all of that. And then I cut it right back to Chicago and then make people realize this started in Chicago with a small intimate ceremony, which is them and their family. And then I did this packing sequence with them of, you know, packing up all their stuff, having coffee together, getting their bags and heading out the door. So what I wanted to convey was that whole sense of like, this is where we live but this is where we're going to celebrate. And mm -hmm. I thought that was conveyed really well through that story. I pitched that idea to them. They're like 1000%. That sounds fantastic. Let's do it. So we shot that other stuff on other days and we pieced it all together. And yeah, I mean, you shoot alongside someone like Narav. I mean, he's just like, he's insane. He like, he's a master of light. And I definitely attribute some of that stuff to him. Uh, just because he picked certain spots that were just mind blowing. And yeah, we ended the night just kind of like a cap the film with just a shot of them in the dark backlit. We kicked some dust up in the air and I threw a tilt shift lens on and it was just this slow motion pan in uh, on a stabilizer until like just, just flare comes up and I just let it sit and resonate so that the viewer could just be like, 
what did I just watch? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think that like the thing that if, if I were asking the question more eloquently, you know, it's like what factors made it pop would be like your ability to lean into what makes you mm-hmm. different. I know that, I mean, that's kind of like, you, you know, your, your catchphrase right. at this point, but like you, like the, the way the film, when you watch it, it is so different than what's out, you know, like it's just different. And like that isn't going to be attractive to everyone, sure. but what it's going to do is it's going to attract the people that find your differences to be the most attractive. And yep. then when you do that, you get into this place of creativity where it's like, well, with that couple, they were, they would be willing to do literally anything creatively that you would right. give them. And there's this high that it's like, are you kidding me? Like we can come to your house and I can do a coffee scene and like camera over the, the luggage and you guys packing and then shots at the airport and this, and it's just in the meat, you know, if you were thinking, well, that's going to be an hour of time at their house and it's going to, I'm going to have to park on the street and it's going to cost $4 and I'm going to have to fly. And it's going to be, it's like, yes, I get that. But in, you know, you said you don't have to pay for advertising. That was your paid advertising. And now you can let that sit and the people that are going to be attracted to you that want you to film their wedding say, I just saw that video and I want that. Can you do something like that? But with us, and then it's like, heck yeah, I can do something like that because I can be creative just like that with them. Cause you're the artist that like is painting the picture. You're the only one that knows how to paint it the way you want right. to paint it. So like by being able to like show more of what's really deep down inside of you create creatively, like you're only going to attract more of that. So like leaning into what makes you different has caused this tidal wave for yeah. you to like now get all these incredible opportunities. Absolutely. Yeah. I couldn't have worded it better myself. And then like, well, I'm really good at this <laughs> stuff. So, <laughs> uh, and so if, you, thanks, if you look man. at, if you look at it from the perspective of, I will make this money back. You're almost looking at it from everything I book after this is, all, all of the money I'm missing out on from doing this one wedding for marketing is almost being paid in perpetuity by the ones that you're making later. You know, if you look at it through that perspective, yeah. it's like I can charge those prices now double uh, what I was charging then, if not more, because I yeah. made the investment in doing that one that way. And it was just one time. Right. You know, like so it, like you, if you would have said, hey, it's six, seven, eight thousand dollars to do this wedding, they would have probably said no. They right? want, I mean, they probably they, said we couldn't we can't do that. The Yosemite for one sure would have said no. Um, so, I'm sorry. What? It glitched out. What? Sorry. They for sure would have said no. Their max budget was yeah. like 3500 That's it. So if you think about it, though, you probably lost out on around $5,500. It would have probably been an eight to $10,000 project if you would have charged full price, you know. So you, you, you lost out on around 5500 then. Um, just ballpark, what would you say, just adding it up in your head, that this film so far has revenue-wise led you to make? Uh after after two years it's uh it's got to be at least 30, 40 grand and literally <laughs> with the ones that i've booked from it yeah and like i said earlier with uh the podcast i was on earlier today it looks like that commercial shoot is gonna pay a pretty large check and it's almost exclusively because of that film um that interviewer saw that film from our mutual friend and said he rewatched it more times than he could remember and shared it with like all of his family shared it with the CEO of his company White House Custom Color and then he said yeah I want to chat with him about making a film for us so and you just never know you just never know and like I mean come on I mean that's probably gonna you're probably gonna make well over six figures more because of this stepping stone and if you look at things as like we're not stopping here when we're building this portfolio, this is just a stepping stone to get us to where we want to mm-hmm. go. You said earlier, like you don't do discounts. You don't have to do the discounts anymore because there's enough people, there's enough demand for what you right. do. Um, and there's a lot of factors that go in that. The video had to be killer. You know, the audio had to be killer. The story had to be killer. And I know that you really, um, you spend a lot of time like really focusing on those mm-hmm. things. So um, with the little, like we have a little bit of time um, left. I want to talk about just like um, the way you do your storytelling, the kind of audio that you, like the, the importance of audio um, and your use of music, that kind of stuff. 
Um, and then after that, I know that you do some education, some workshops, some things like that, that I want to make sure and, and all that good stuff. So like with, with your storytelling, um, you know, I know that we've talked and you said story over everything. What does that mean to you? Yeah, it's, so I'm not a gearhead. I don't claim to be super proficient in understanding log profiles and how to grade perfectly and export settings and that's why Matt Johnson exists. You just go to watch all his videos to, to do this. Uh, but I care far more about how it's going to emotionally um, change someone's perspective watching it than caring how visually stimulating it is. Sure, like the, the visual aspect is a huge component of the storytelling, but because there's, mm -hmm. I, I mean, there's things I cringe about with the Yosemite film now. Like, would, I would have shot it completely different now. And I literally shot half of that thing on a 5D Mark III. It's like, that's a freaking dinosaur in 2019, you know? It was kind of a mm -hmm. dinosaur then. I rented the 5D Mark IV <laughs> for the first time shooting that wedding because I knew I needed to step up my game a bit. So I did. And it was good. It, it was what I needed to take that next step. But now, like, the 5D4 is a dinosaur. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so I totally forgot where I was going with the train of thought. What was the question? The question was, what does story Can over everything frozen? mean? Right. Um, I'm frozen. No, you're good now. So, yeah, uh, if that component of story and nostalgia isn't there, it's just not going to resonate with strangers in the way that it can. And it's one thing to make your clients cry when watching the film because of the emotional response of seeing and hearing all of their favorite people on one of the best days of their life. And it's, it's another thing to have a complete stranger be like, I just watched this film in my basement and I'm crying and I don't know these people at all. Uh, that's a totally different response, a totally different perspective on how well you can tell a story. Because ultimately, like, this is... This is not about like doing, let's be honest, filming weddings is cool. Don't get me wrong. It's a very fun thing. It's not like the most astounding, incredible, super cool, amazing thing in the world. Like it's, we're not making Hollywood films. We're making something that we are giving to our clients that they can have for decades. And that's, what's important. It's really not about mm -hmm. us. And so what I really care about is having I producing something for them that's going to stand the test of time and be an heirloom for them and their family. Uh, I'm sure you know Josh Helton a little long distance. He's my good buddy. Mm -hmm. He just posted something the other day. I was like, can you imagine what it would feel like to have a wedding film from our grandparents' wedding right now? Like to see their mm -hmm. faces and hear their voices and what they were like back then. We are literally doing that right now for two generations in the future. Like they mm -hmm. are going to be able to see these and to tell that story in a compelling way, like I was able to do for so many couples, uh, that's, that gets me so stoked, so excited. Uh, and that's so much more fulfilling than trying to be the coolest person in the industry and having the, mm -hmm. the best gear and all the, the best visuals and all that stuff. I don't discredit it. It's fine. It's a good business strategy. Uh, I just not, I'm not in the business of that being the priority. I want, I want the nostalgia in the story to take root and be the, the most important thing to have that emotional response for decades, to have their children have that emotional response. Like, can you imagine just like if you have, if you're tight with your parents and you see that film mm -hmm. ugh, at the age of 20, yeah. like, and they're still like totally in love and you're just like, Oh my gosh. You're like, this is incredible. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you really are thinking like these films that I'm shooting are going to outlive me, you know, That's, it's like it, like, wait a sec, hold up. You know, you, you start to shoot it a little differently. And I think that so many people are just so focused on these numbers next to our names, right? Like they want to have a big following and they're trying to think, okay, this shot will look good or get me likes on Instagram yeah. or, and I think it's all good and well, but like the numbers will show up if you're just right. leaning into what's making you different. So like, I mean, the story side of everything is, is so important, you know, catching that. And I think that that is what is going to draw people, you know, if it's just pretty these days, I mean, everybody can make something pretty, but like the way that you craft that story is, is so, so like so big in your, in your business to do it the way that you would want to tell that story. That's what's going to make you different than others. Um, 
All right. I, there's a lot of other things we could talk I, about. We're running short on time. Can I clarify one thing? Go ahead. Go right ahead. So, yeah. I, when I, and when I say like, when I went on the rant about wedding filmmaking not being the coolest thing ever, uh, it's, it's not that I don't think it's cool. I think it's like so many people look at what we do and they're like, I wish I could, I so wish I could do something like that. It is. It's very cool. I'm talking from the perspective of just having enough humility to recognize that you're not the center of the universe when it comes to this stuff. Like that's not yeah, what's that's important big. at all. Uh, what's important is to have some humility and recognize that your clients are what's the important thing and their families, the legacy you're leaving. The fact that you said that you're out like these films will outlive you. That's mind blowing. I haven't heard that before. That's, it's so cool to think about that, but that's what's sustainable. That's what it will allow you to do it for years because if you just if you're just in it for the cool factor and you're in it for like having the coolest stuff, there's the burnout rate I've seen is just so terrible. Like yeah. if you're not in it for the right reasons and you don't like care about the nuance of each couple every time in their unique story and telling it the right way, you're going to crash and burn because it's just gonna be the same thing over and over and you'll get tired of it and you won't think it's cool mm -hmm. anymore. So that's all I mean by that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that was good clarification because I was a little offended. <laughs> I could see it in your <laughs> face. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I, I wasn't. You probably glitched out at that time. I wasn't really offended. <laughs> I, I <laughs> internet. Um, okay, so that's great. There's so much more. Um, before we get into talking about some of the education stuff you do, we have a Facebook yep. group. Um, it's just How to Film Weddings on Facebook. Shameless plug, of course. Um, inside that group, I posted today your video um, like five minutes before we got to recordings to asking if anybody had any questions mm -hmm. for you. Um, and mainly just goofball comments. But one guy, <laughs> uh, you mentioned him earlier, Matt Johnson, asked, tell, tell Eric that Matt wants to know what his fans call him. <laughs> we, and this is a PG podcast, so I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we should just have them uh, look at your Venture, yeah, community over competition vlog that I post a month ago. Then you can see the nonsense that is Matt Johnson and the T-shirt he made. It was awesome. <laughs> and I'm not going to say it because of bleeping, yeah. but it was fun. No, um, and then another guy, Scott Ralph, said he said... Uh, Let's see. I saw a real Tesla on the road with my son the other day. I said, hey, look, it's a Tesla. And now every time he sees a Pontiac, he yells Tesla, daddy. <laughs> so I just that, that wasn't really a, a question, but I thought that was hilarious. So um, <laughs> if you're not in our Facebook group, definitely check it out. How to film weddings on Facebook. Um, I, I want to talk to you at the last part here just about I know you do a lot of education. You've talked about it. Your YouTube channel has a ton of education. You do workshops. Why don't you kind of tell me like what you're doing for education, where people can find you um, for that kind of education stuff, just so people know where to connect with yeah, you. Uh, so I'm always available if you DM me on Instagram or shoot me an email, which you can find on my site. But I do have a whole education tab on my site uh, that you can access information on. I always do mentor sessions, so you can sign up for a personal mentor session, or if you want to set up a small group of people, I do some discounted rates if you group up. Uh, but I am starting to roll out classes and workshops this year. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any wedding filmmaking ones yet. That's, a, that's for the future. Right now, I'm doing uh, photography primarily for the classes of this year. Uh, I've titled it Eric's Photo Class, and it really dives into the, the aspect of creative portraiture um, being creative with your business and creative strategy to grow your business. And then uh, I, I really kind of lean into the philosophy of portraiture and photojournalism in the end. And it gets like super emotional and hopefully very inspiring. But everybody that took it in February, um, from what I read on the reviews, really loved it. Bringing it to Kansas City, which I believe, yeah, that's going to be after this post. But uh, July 7th, I'm bringing it to Chicago, right in my studio here, Creative Club Chicago. And tickets are 500 bucks, full day with a meal included, and you get to meet awesome other photographers in the industry. And it's going to be a really good time. That's awesome. And your Instagram, uh, we'll tag you in it, but it's just your name, yeah. correct? Eric Floberg. Some Swedish guy okay. has Eric Floberg, and I'm bitter about it. Some old man has John Bunn. And he's now it's zero posts on everything, but he owns it. I've messaged him for five years. I've tried so many times. Hey man, I'll 
I will literally pay you money to stop. So, yeah, I'm John Bunn with an underscore, which is almost as cool. I got like a tail at the end of my name. <laughs> I missed your joke entirely. It just completely cut out. Darn it. <laughs> it was funny. Just like laugh or like pretend. <laughs> no, man. Uh, well, I know we could keep going for a while. Um, I appreciate all this. I mean, I really think in, in recap for me, like leaning into what makes you different, um, to what makes you unique, it's okay to do that and to like be able to have stepping stones and be and know that it's okay that you're stopping by certain parts of your career instead of just, you know, oh, I can't do this discounted rate. You know, it's like, it is a process mm-hmm. and you will get there. And we're all on the process. Like, like if you have 50,000 people following you or 10 following you or whatever, you're, you know, or you're 10 years into business or two years, we're all on a process and like, we're here to help get each other better. So listeners check out Eric's stuff for sure. Um, jump on a mentor session with him or a coaching session. Ta- uh, his teaching is incredible on his YouTube channel. So many different things. Anything you want to say before I jump off of I here? I just want to say I appreciate you and thank you for letting Yes, tell me more about it. <laughs> I just love, I tell just me, love your buttery, great... smooth voice and your Michael Scott mug in the background. Oh, yeah. It's pretty yeah. impressive, the collection. My buttery, that. smooth voice. <laughs> well, I appreciate you glitching out during times that you shouldn't have and missing my jokes. <laughs> Uh, no, but it's been a, been a fun time. If you don't follow this guy, we'll link him all in all the places. And I guess until next time, we'll see you.